Hi, welcome to the lecture on Adam Smith and free markets. So today we're going to look at why Adam Smith believes that free markets are the best types of markets. Now, what we mean by best is two different senses. We mean best in the sense of beneficial, and we also mean best in the sense of moral or just. He's going to argue two things that free markets are the most just type of economic system, and also that free markets are the ones that will produce the most overall prosperity for everybody within the system. So first, we're going to talk about why he believes free markets are best. But before we do that, we have to be very clear what he means by free market. First of all, he never uses in the wealth of nations, he never uses the term free market. Instead, he often uses the, the phrase markets that are at liberty or have liberty in them. And this is really important because our term liberty as it was used in England at the time and also as it's used now is very much about freedom, isn't it? It's all about this value that everybody should be such that they are only forced to do things that benefit everybody and therefore are never forced to do things which will hurt themselves. They are given this maximal amount of free will, of choice in what they do. So to that end, he means two things by free. He means that first of all, it's free from what you might call, the market is free from what you might call top-down regulation, okay? Now, top-down regulation can take many forms, maybe tariffs, trade tariffs, which is what he specifically talks about in book four of The Wealth of Nations, is during his time, English, the English government put tariffs on foreign goods to protect local industry. That would be an example of top-down regulation of the market. That's by the government, where the government forces prices of foreign goods up by taxing them and therefore allowing supposedly local sellers of say wool to be able to compete with these foreign things. He's going to say that is an example of a non-free market because you have the government interfering and making decisions about pricing from the top down. But you can also have private industry do the same thing. You might have heard of price fixing that can often occur among in local areas where all the gas stations privately agree that they're going to um, charge $3.50 a gallon and that no one's going to charge less than anybody else. In that case, what you have again is another top-down regulation where the prices are artificially fixed, not by the market, but by a smaller group who then determines and interferes with the market. So that would be an example of a non-free market. So a market is free when it's free from that kind of regulation from the top and not from the individual competition of sellers and buyers doing what they do naturally. So you might say that a non-free market is a non-natural market. It's a market whose forces are dictated by individual interference by, by humans rather than by the hurly-burly of just regular business interaction in that area. But there's another sense in which a market could, could not be free, and that's when that market is unequal. Now, what do we mean by that? We mean specifically that the market is set up so that certain groups or individuals have advantage in their buying and selling, in their economic business over others, an inherent advantage. It might be through a monopoly that occurs. So when, for example, you have Cox Cable in a certain area, and that's the only cable that you can buy, and thus because they control the market, then they artificially set up the prices more than people would have paid if there had been competition. 
And so thus, when all competition is destroyed and a certain sector of the economy then controls the prices in the economy, then that's an unfree market. Any kind of market where one group or subgroup, maybe buyers or sellers, are put at an advantage in the competition, that would be an unfree market. So thus, what is a free market? A free market is an equal market and it is a non-regulated market. But we have to be very careful what we mean by non-regulated. He doesn't mean that it's a free-for-all because these two have to be both present. The market has to be both equal and unregulated, which means when there is a monopoly or when an inequality occurs even naturally, within a market where one business just wins out against all other businesses, then it will be the job of the government to maintain that equality by busting up that monopoly and thereby reachieving an equal advantage for all parties involved in the economic system. So thus, the idea is to produce the kind of market where competition is maximal and therefore equality in competition is maximal. And that can only occur when the government interferes as little as possible in the market and only when an unequal condition prevails. So once we understand that, then the question is, well, why is a free market of this type the best kind of market? And he's going to say, first of all, it's the most just system. Now, what does that mean? Well, we have to not read Wealth of Nations here. He assumes that when you read Wealth of Nations, that you've already read his moral treatise on what it is for things to be just and appropriate kinds of actions and attitudes. He wrote a book called The Theory of the Moral Sentiments. And what he's really doing in Wealth of Nations is applying his moral theory to economics, and in this case, to what is called, is called political economics. And he states that the, the function of the government in the beginning of book four is just twofold. It's to ensure the maximal prosperity of everybody in the nation, and also the maximal prosperity of the government itself. And so if that's the case, then, the question is, how is that achieved? And how is that achieved in such a way that everyone gets a part of that prosperity and not just some? So again, we see another myth busted about Adam Smith, that, that the whole point of the wealth of nations or of capitalist systems or free markets is just simply that people get as rich as possible. He does agree that the, the desire for riches propels the economy, but he thinks that this self-interest has to always be such that it's in the interest of spreading that prosperity out equally in a fair way. So what is fairness for him? That's what we have to ask, because we're saying that, that he's saying that the free market is a fair system, and it has to be. Well, we have to ask what makes it act unfair or unjust for him. And it all boils down to what he calls sympathy or our ability as human beings. We make our moral judgments based on our ability to put ourselves in our neighbor's shoes, to imagine ourselves in their situation. And then because we can imagine ourselves in their situation, certain feelings or sympathies are produced or not. So if I see someone being slapped in the face, I can put myself, I naturally put myself in their situation. And I then, by doing that, imagine that happening to me. And when it happens to me, when I imagine that, then certain feelings are produced in me. If those feelings are the same as what I observe, if those actions are the same as what I observe in the person who I observe being slapped in the face, then I sympathize with them. In other words, I have the same feelings as they do, and therefore I approve necessarily of their reaction and their attitude. Because if I have the same feelings, then that's the that, that's amount to saying, I feel the same way, I feel your pain. So thus all action, our moral judgments about other people's actions are all about 
whether we sympathize with them or not. So then how does this work about saying our judgments about whether somebody did something just or unjust? He says, look, it's not just about whether I personally sympathize with you, because I may not be able to totally put myself in your shoes. And if I can't, then I'm partial, you see that? And therefore I myself may make a wrong judgment about whether I sympathize or not, because I can't sympathize or not sympathize about your situation until I'm totally in your situation. So if I have partiality, if I don't like you, if something like that occurs, or if I just don't have total information about what you're going through, then I am not going to make the kind of judgment my best self would make. So this idea of a best self, of an ideal spectator, he calls the impartial spectator. And he's saying, this is what we are really doing when we try to make a moral judgment, is we try to imagine ourselves or other people as these impartial spectators. Impartial meaning two senses of not partial. No partial information. We know totally what the person is going through and understand their situation completely in all the relevant details. And also, impartial in the sense of not having an ax to grind, not having a special interest that then influences our judgment. So thus all judgments about moral actions are really us imagining ourselves and others as these impartial spectators observing the actions of others and imagining what they're going through, putting themselves in that other person's shoes. <clears throat> So for example, let us say that I observe as I'm walking through Salve one day, some guy tripping someone as they're walking down the hall. That's the doer of the action, the person who's tripping. And then there's the student who's tripped. That's the receiver of this action of being tripped. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, here I am, I'm the spectator. And ideally, I'm the impartial spectator. I have no ax to grind. I don't know either of these people. And so I, I have no special interest involved. But also, I'm there, I saw the whole thing happen. And I know there weren't any special circumstances behind it. I know that the person who did this just was doing it for fun you might say, they enjoyed seeing this person embarrassed and hurt. So now what do I do? I naturally put myself in the do in the self of the, in, in the shoes of the receiver, right? I naturally also put myself in the shoes of the doer. And in doing this, I don't sympathize with the doer, but I do sympathize with the receiver to the extent that what, to the extent that when I put myself in his or her shoes, I feel resentment toward the person who tripped me. Now, he didn't trip me, but now I imagine it happening to me. And I imagine that if I'm in that situation, I'm going to feel resentment and a desire to get back and repay this terrible person for what they did. So thus, what is an unjust act? It's an act that would an impartial spectator would feel resentment on behalf of the receiver of the action toward the doer of the action. They would feel as if they were harmed if they were in their place and therefore desire revenge or get back on behalf of the doer. And since it's the impartial spectator, then their judgment would be appropriate because it'd be based on full information and it wouldn't be based on any acts to grind. So once we understand this, we understand now thus what a just system would look, at, look like, right? A just market would have these three characteristics. First, it would be this equity or equality between buyers and sellers. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that no one would feel resentment 
at the price they had to pay for the good they're buying. And no one would feel resentment at the price they were receiving for the good they were selling. Because both parties would feel as if they were not suffering harm or loss based on how the transaction took place. So thus, there can't be favoring of one party over their other, can't there? Uh, industry or the government can't favor producers over consumers by artificially set, allowing the producers to raise their prices simply to protect their industry from foreign incursion. You see, Adam Smith, when he's talking about free markets, is always talking about the competition that occurs between nations. And therefore, we might think of Chinese goods coming into the United States, being sold in Walmart at a way cheaper price. And that's why I call it the Great Wall of Mart. And as a result, thus, we have this problem, right, then that American producers, their prices are too high, their quality of their goods is not, it, it is not as good as the Chinese goods. And as a result, the government is tempted to protect the local merchant by imposing tariffs and tax on the Chinese. But by doing that, what happens? Well, what happens is it raises the price of the Chinese goods so that what was the fair market price based on just legitimate competition between different businesses now gets inflated so that the consumer now has to buy at a loss, don't they? And if you put yourself in the consumer's shoes, Smith would say, you would resent that. Any impartial spectator would resent that they have to pay more simply to benefit some other person and that person um, doesn't deserve it per se. And so thus, when I have this equity between buyer and seller, what it means is both are both buying and selling and getting the value that they're willing to get based on putting each other, putting themselves in each other's shoes. And then therefore the seller doesn't feel resentment for the price they, they, the, the profit they made, they feel like they made a fair price and the buyer doesn't feel resentment on having to pay more than the product is worth. And so thus only a free market does that because when you have this regulation that occurs or monopolies, this always artificially sets the prices higher or lower than they ought to be. If it favors the buyer, then you have the sellers who are taken advantage of, and they are gonna feel resentment because they have to sell their product at below what they can reasonably expect to get for it, and therefore are selling at a loss. But if it favors the producer, then the seller, then, then the buyer feels a loss and is therefore unjustly treated. And so thus a free market is the only kind of market where there's not gonna be any resentment in buying and selling overall, because overall what's gonna happen is both buyers and sellers through supply and demand are naturally going to be selling and buying at the price that both are willing to pay and sell for. So now, what this means is this is the kind of market where there is no forced benevolence. Okay, now for, for Adam Smith, benevolence is something, a person is benevolent when they're generous. And being generous means you do something for somebody in such a way that the impartial spectator feels gratitude on behalf of the person you were generous just like an unjust action is an action where they feel resentment on behalf of the person you did this to. A benevolent action is where the impartial spectator feels gratitude on your behalf. They put themselves in your shoes. They approve of the act of generosity as, a, as if the right thing, the appropriate thing to do. And in putting themselves in your shoes, they feel gratitude toward that person. And so benevolence is all about freedom, isn't it? I can't be forced to be benevolent because when a person is benevolent or generous, they're giving at a loss. 
they are doing something that's sacrificial that they don't have to do. But if the government or some other entity manipulates the markets to distribute income so that maybe the poor get more so I can overcome the income gap inequality. If, if, the, if the market is forced into that so that goods are distributed not according to their natural circulation and price, but according to this redistribution, then what happens is you're forcing people to be benevolent, aren't you? Aren't you? And if you're forcing them to be benevolent, then you're actually being unjust to them because you are forcing a loss onto them that they are unwilling to give and they should feel resentment. And so thus forced benevolence is unjust. So we see, Summing it all up, this first reason, free markets are the only just markets because they're the only markets where the prices of things are based on the mutual sympathies of all the parties involved in economic transactions, the buyers and the sellers, so that the, the market price tends to gravitate to its real value, he says. And because it tends to gravitate to its real value, each person putting themselves in the other person's shoes, the buyer putting themselves in the seller's shoes, the seller putting themselves in the buyer's shoes in an impartial way, will feel like that they would sell for the price that they're buying for and that they would buy for the price they're selling for. And thus, everyone, no one is forced to be harm, to harm their own self-interest in a transaction. And therefore, only such a market is one that is just, he says. So free markets are best because they're morally best, but they're also best because overall, when you are trying to be a do-gooder as a government um, leader, you're trying to increase the prosperity of everyone. Yeah, you're trying to eliminate poverty. You're trying to allow there to be a more equal distribution of that, pro of, of that prosperity. You're trying to protect local businesses from foreign ones. You're trying to increase the national revenue in such a way that the nation itself is wealthier in the long run. That's, none of that is bad, he says. But the problem is when you try to regulate that, you actually end up doing just the opposite. So let's see why. So what he's going to argue is that if you want to produce the most prosperity for the most people, then what you need to do is set the market free. Don't set artificial regulation and don't as a government leader go in there and start trying to set prices by regulating the flow of foreign goods into the country by setting tariffs by actually in some senses setting price fixing so that, okay, the prices have to be low. We can't allow inflation to go too high. So we're doing a price freeze on gas or something like that. We see that there's the temptation to do that now, especially because of runaway inflation, right? Now, and we see that there's a temptation and there has been the attempt to protect American goods from Chinese incursion. And so, and over the last four years or so, there's been a trade war between China and the United States. And the idea is we try to fight that war by putting exorbitant tariffs on Chinese goods to even the playing field, we say. And he's saying, no, in the long run, that's actually gonna hurt our economy. It's not gonna help it. Well, why? Well, you have to understand what he believes is the general way in which business is done. It's done in such a way that when everybody pursues their own self-interest, it always ends up in the long run creating public prosperity. So Adam Smith is often mistaken as believing what another philosopher that lived around his era believed, a guy named Mandeville. And Mandeville was very famous in his fable of the bees, 
by saying this, that private vice leads to public virtue. And his idea was what? Is that greed is good, right? That when everyone individually is striving to take advantage and to get the most for themselves and not caring about anybody else, they end up creating so much prosperity for themselves that it overflows to everybody else. And so this private vice leads to this public good. Adam Smith actually isn't on board with that idea at all. He's often mistaken at it because we often read, you know, the people read his introduction to the wealth of nations and they remember the famous quote where, we, where he says that, you know, when we go to the butcher, we are not going to appeal to his benevolence to get our, our, our meat. Instead, we're going to appeal to his self-interest. And then that's interpreted as, see, everything is about self-interest. That's because people haven't read the theory of moral sentiments. What he's saying is concentrating on is not the butcher. He's not saying it's good that the butcher is self-interested. Instead, he's saying that we ourselves must recognize that we can't emphasize our own self-interest if we want something from the butcher. We have to pay attention to the butcher's self-interest too and put ourselves in the butcher's shoes would we want something for nothing? Would we want someone to force us to give something for nothing? And the answer is no. When we put ourselves in the other person's shoes, we know that, that as impartial spectators, we wouldn't want something, we wouldn't want to have to give out something and get nothing in return. And therefore, we aren't going to ask something from the butcher without giving something in return for their self-interest. So it's really about justice and equality, that statement. It's not about whether the, whether the economy is fueled by greed or not. But he does say this, that when a person legitimately seeks their self-interest, which they should, then that in the end will produce local prosperity and see how that works. He calls it an invisible hand. It's invisible because even though the local businessman is not striving to be a do-gooder, they're trying to make a profit, but in the end, invisibly without intending to do so, especially when they don't intend to better the whole, they end up bettering the whole by, by bettering their own self-interest. So how does that work? Well, it works like this. The capitalist, we're going to call the business person the capitalist because for Adam Smith, capital is that portion of my stock, my, my resources that are over and above the things that I need for my sustenance. And so that's the stuff that then I naturally use to make a profit. That's what capital means for Adam Smith. It's the stuff and resources and tools that are used to make income or a profit over and above my sustenance. So the capitalist is the person who has that sufficiency and therefore has stock to invest. And what is the stock, what is the capitalist always going to do? In book two of The Wealth of Nations, he makes this principle. The principle is that in a secure nation, in a nation where there are laws and we're not afraid that somebody's gonna come and steal everything from us, the barbarians aren't gonna come and rape, pillage, and plunder. In such a nation, the person who makes capital does one of two things with it. They either consume it or they reinvest it to make a greater profit. And the thing is, is since everybody pretty much wants to get more prosperous than they actually are, then almost always what they don't consume, what's more than they can consume, they will invest into more capital and therefore greater stock. And so that means that the local business person in any area their natural tendency is to want is to inject capital, more capital into the local economy. As they get more prosperous, they spend more and they will spend in two ways. They will consume more, which means that the things they don't make themselves, they're gonna buy. 
and they will always prefer to buy local, he says. Then you might say, wait, well, why? Well, think about it. If you're gonna buy foreign, okay, foreign goods and foreign outsourcing, you have to go and you have to, um, it, it's, it's less convenient, isn't it? So that's the first part. But also they're gonna prefer to sell their goods locally. This is really important. And again, it's because when you sell foreign, then what you have to do is get the goods to that foreign market and it's more expensive and it's more tedious and there's more labor involved. So if I can get a halfway decent price locally, then I'd rather sell it locally, even if I might get a higher price in a foreign market, he says, simply because of the convenience involved in selling locally and buying locally. And so thus the capitalist naturally injects more capital into the local economy, he says. Well, then what happens? Well, as this is injected into the overall revenue of the economy, then that means that overall there's more stock and capital in the entire system. And that correlates with more industry, again, because of this basic principle that the capitalists and all the capitalists are always striving to increase their capital. And the only way to increase their capital is to use it in more production, which means that when capital increases, production and industry increases. And when production and industry increases, then guess what? You need more jobs, don't you? And because you need more jobs, then there's more competition for laborers, which then raises the natural wages of the laborer. And thus prosperity increases overall based on this invisible hand of people just acting in their own self-interest. It's more in my interest as a person who is a local businessman to sell locally than it is to sell foreign. Think of it in another way. When I try to sell my goods in China, that might be great. I might have a good market and I might want to do that. But I would prefer to sell locally because I know the people locally. I know what advertising works. I, I know the local customs. I know I can make better connections with people without having the problem of having to speak another language like Chinese or something or having to navigate foreign laws. When the laws here locally, I know them and I know them better, or my lawyers know them better, and I don't have to hire foreign lawyers at, at higher prices. And so again, this is another perspective in which we see that the, that the capitalists, because they want to make more money, and because they want it at a more convenient way, are going to inject things locally. Again, it's invisible hand of prosperity that guides the self-interest of the capitalist to prosper the entire economy locally. So thus, what does that mean? That means that any government regulator or any other foreign and artificial regulating interferes with this process. And therefore, they're kind of like trying to make a river flow by damming it. Doesn't work. So that's his first reason as to why free markets, when they're allowed to be free, are actually gonna to lead to more prosperity naturally because you're just allowing this invisible hand to work itself out. Okay, but now think about what that might mean for foreign markets. Again, he's not saying free market like this. Okay, we're gonna let the local market be free, but then we're gonna put tariffs to protect that local market from foreign competition. That's not really free because the, the local market can't be free if there is no foreign competition. Why? Well, think about it. Let's go back to his example in Wealth of Nations. I set these tariffs on French wool so that the local British wool industry is protected from foreign competition. Well, let's imagine it without that, right? Let's imagine the French wool coming in and since it's cheaper and of greater quality, then it what? Then it beats the local competition. Local, the people in England are now buying French wool over and above the English wool. So why is that a good thing, you might say? Isn't that destroying the, the British industry in this area? 
Well, let's just look at it from a purely economic perspective. Cheaper foreign goods now, right? So if I'm a local businessman, say I'm a, someone who wants to buy that wool because I'm a tailor or because I'm a cloth manufacturer, then the cheaper I can buy that wool, the cheaper I can make my products. And the cheaper I can make my products, the, the, the lower the prices I can set for the consumer. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that cheaper foreign goods lead to decreased expenses for those who use the wool in making, in, in making clothing products, correct? Like sweaters. And those decreased in expenses mean overall that the profit margin goes up. And so therefore, cheaper foreign goods means decreased expenses, which means increased capital for the local cloth manufacturer, textile industry. And thus textile industry does what? Well, the capitalist who's the textile industrialist now has more capital. And we saw that when they have more capital, they naturally strive to make it more productive. And therefore they inject that capital into the local economy, which again increases industry and jobs. Maybe not in the area of wool, but in the area of textiles. And thus the overall revenue of the English economy rises, even though the wool industry suffers. So if I'm, a, if I'm a, a, just an individual person who has a household, a family, right? If I can buy shoes cheaper than making them myself, isn't it smarter just to buy the shoes? What does that mean? It saves me money, which means I can take the money I save and invest it in other areas, right? So thus, what we see is even though short term, there might be a loss in jobs in the wool industry, in the long term, the collapse of that particular industry means that the capital that was originally spent and wasted on that industry can now be redirected into a more profitable direction. When the overall capital of a nation increases, a particular decrease in the local particular industry in the long run is a good thing and not a bad thing. It produces overall more jobs and redirects those jobs to more competitive directions that are more stable. So he says that the whole idea of trying to protect local industry is a bad thing because in the end, it decreases the quality of the industry and it artificially resuscitates a dead body and all the resources that are used to resuscitate that dead body that are not used to make more living bodies. So we see that the first reason why we want to allow free markets is because when those markets are allowed to take their natural course through competition, free and equal competition, then naturally the things that we are good at will increase and that will benefit the whole economy and the things we're bad at will decrease and therefore the stuff that we're investing in that bad stuff can be redirected to the things that we're actually competitive in. And this all happens without somebody having to regulate it. So now you might say, yeah, but if Adam Smith can figure that out, then wouldn't it be better if that was all centrally planned? Wouldn't it be better if in fact, what we did was allow government to plan this out? Well, how is that going to happen though? Well, we somehow have to believe that the central agency of the planet, maybe a committee, maybe a Senate or a legislator, maybe a single tyrant, right? Has to have more knowledge than, on the, than those on the ground, don't we? We have to believe that somehow the person who's up here and far away from all of the intricate business dealings of the local economy knows more about the local conditions than the people who are on the ground and actually doing the business. But that's absurd, isn't it? So that's his second argument. 
for why free markets need to be run from the bottom up rather than from the top down. Let's think of it like this. If you're going to be successful in your business, say you're going to make sweaters. Don't you have to make stuff that people will buy? If they won't buy it, you can't sell it. And if you can't sell it, you're going down the tube business-wise. So what sets prices? Well, demand does, doesn't it, right? It's demand that dictates supply. Yeah, we say supply and demand, but what we really mean is without demand, you shouldn't have a supply and there won't be a supply for very long. So who knows the demand, right? How the value of a product is set by its demand, but who understands demand? If I'm going to make something, if I'm going to, for example, set goals for a particular industry, this is very famous what has happened in a lot of planned economies. If you remember five-year plans in communism, right? We're going to set a certain goal that in this five-year span, we're going to increase steel production by 30%. Okay, so that's the central mandate. And then that's put down to the local industries and smelters and, and miners and everything. And they all now have to meet this demand of making 30% increase in steel production. Fine, let's say they do that. Was there a 30% increase in demand? Did they consider that? Did they consider that actually the, the increase in supply would also track an increase in demand? No, and this is why most of the time these five-year plans fail because they couldn't understand, they couldn't predict what the market would be like. Well, then who's in the best position to predict it? Well, obviously the sellers and the buyers themselves. Who sets the demand? The buyers. Who understands the demand the best? Those who are close to the buyers, the local sellers and industries who have experience with this on a daily basis. It's these local people that will know the conditions, Adam Smith says. So he says, look, if some government official wants to set the price of wool, but the average wool manufacturer knows way better from being a wool manufacturer, what kind of prices his wool will sell for in his area and what won't sell because he has experience doing this. And so the minute it's set from the top down, there's an assumption that the one on the top who's far away from the circumstances that determine the price somehow knows more than the person who's close to the circumstances that determine the demand and therefore the value and the price. And that's absurd. So to sum up, free markets are the only kind of markets that allow the people who know the most to determine the prices. And these are the people who are actually selling and buying. And thus supply and demand determines things rather than supply without demand or supply in hope of demand or supply demanding demand can't work. Centralized economies fail because they don't know enough. They're at a level where they have theory, but no facts to back up the theory. Whereas surprisingly enough, Economies that are not planned, he is saying, economies that just allow the individual businesses to compete and to follow the blind forces of supply and demand always know more because they're always close to the situation. And therefore, like a surfer can surf the wave because they're right there for the opportunity rather than trying to plan it by doing some mathematical algorithm. So free markets are great because they are the most just. They force no one to buy or sell at a loss. They force no one to be benevolent and they don't force resentment and therefore they're just. And they are the most prosperous because they allow the invisible hand that naturally takes self-interest and converts it to public prosperity to work freely. And when working freely on the ground, 
does so from the most knowledge and therefore produces the best or wisest results without having to think about it.